love you all so much and uh, so appreciate you being planted in the local church, a place of grace where you know you're loved completely, completely. There's no disappointment in the Father concerning you, none. Your life is hid in Christ. And uh, this is the beautiful place about our reconciled now mindset. Our mindset has to really agree with God's view of us because then we can live accordingly and his life is dispersed through us. So you're blessed to be planted in this place. It's so wonderful to have uh, friends and uh, so honored to be invited once again to hang out with you all. I've uh, been thinking about the fires and the challenges and praying, of course, for God's people. And uh, like we have prayed this morning for resolution and solutions and in unseen movement of the spirit of grace to solve and resolve these things, but I think this is what our lives are filled with many, many times uh, like surprises. It's like explosions. It's like things that happen in our world that trouble us. And thank God we received a word from your pastor that these cares can be cast once and for all uh, because the Lord cares for us. No one ever cared for you like Jesus, like the old lyric of the song. And uh, it's just so beautiful and powerful. We've had, uh, since I was with you last August, We've had an explosion in our world, like uh, Pastor mentioned, we, we have campuses and teams around the world. One of our campuses is in Beirut, Lebanon, and I bought this uh, old uh, facility. We have a school there for disadvantaged kids. We have thousands of uh, refugees that have come through our facility and been fed and blessed and uh, nourished and ministered to, but um, we had a big explosion in Lebanon last August. And it kind of rocked our world. It surprised us. It surprised everybody in Lebanon, of course, all over the news. So I want to just show you this little video. We bought this campus in 2009 for a million dollars. And uh, we built it out since then. It spent a lot of money. And then it got rattled. And uh, it affected a lot of things. Let me show this video. And then I'll let you know how uh, the gospel changes everything. Let's look at this. Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus, Jesus. From, from the, the Life, Life Center, Center in Beirut. Beirut. I am Pastor, Pastor Saeed, Saeed and I would love to thank you so much for your love, for your support. Um, as you know, in August 4, the big explosion took place is the third after uh, Hiroshima and uh, it destroyed everything here. Almost 4,000 square meters, no windows, no doors, no ceilings, no TVs, no cameras, nothing was left. But thank God for you because you've helped us not only to build the place, but to build the faith and the hope in every heart. Um, you know, three hours before the explosion, the Lord put on my heart to evacuate the place. I don't know why, I didn't know why, but I told everybody, leave the place, leave the place now. And I forced them to leave. They were all shocked. Why? Said, I don't understand why. Go and pray. Go and pray. And as they left, the explosion took place. It's only less than a mile away from the Life Center Beirut. And praise God, since that time, we've been giving food away, giving uh, life away, and um, uh, giving food parcels. Uh, we've been on the street. Our youth went on the streets, helping everyone. And thank God, uh, many of those, 60% of those, they came to the Life Center. They expressed uh, they want to join the Bible study groups. And now we have a big challenge. The challenge is to bring uh, pastors to start small groups with the Lebanese, not only Syrians. Lebanese uh, people. We thank you so much and we love you and we're praying the Lord give you a thousandfold whatever you're doing in Lebanon. May the Lord reward you greatly in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So that's just a little video update of uh, really what happens because people like you are planted in a place of grace and have a generous heart in your tithe and offering to your local church and then the church of course helps uh, sustain uh, ministries like this, these kind of expressions in Muslim regions of the world. So again, thank you so very much. I think uh, this uh, little video showing Saeed, he's my team leader for Mutual Faith uh, Middle East, uh, Mutual Faith Lebanon. And uh, Heidi and I met his uh, father-in-law in 1983. And in 2001, uh, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, God gave me an assignment for the Middle East, and I went over there, and I had, went to four different Arab countries. And I went to Lebanon, had a meeting. Uh, there was 10 people that showed up to the meeting, 10 or 12. They sat in like a little circle, and I had a little podium like this and taught my heart from my assignment for the Middle East. And nobody was interested but one guy. It was this guy. And uh, 
this guy said, I need to introduce you to my father-in-law. So I went to meet his father-in-law, and his father-in-law said, I, I know you. I said, no, sir. He said, have you been to Lebanon before? I said, never, sir. It's my first time. He said, I know, I know you. Have you done work in the Middle East? I said, well, many years ago, back in the 80s. And I remember this was like 2002 now. I said, back in the 80s, my wife and I coordinated a conference on a Greek island called Egana. And it was the Middle East Christian Leadership Assembly. We brought delegates uh, from all over the Middle East, and we coordinated it and brought them out on this Greek island. He said, my wife and I were there. He said, I have pictures with you and your wife that we were looking at recently. So what, what I did 20 years prior was now a seed. Now it's 20 years later. So you never minimize seed. The seed is the substance where you always find your solution. And so this brother is a great gift that's helped us uh, in these explosions. But I want to show you the power of the gospel when things disrupt you. You know, most of us can testify of things we're concerned about or worried about or frustrated about, but it's not assignments that are always, a ta uh, uh, you know, targeted directly toward us. It's like, it's like we're collateral damage. Like this explosion, the second or third largest since the bomb of Hiroshima, this, this wasn't targeted against our ministry, but it affected our ministry. And when it happened, I was depressed for like 72 hours. But then God had his people reach out to me and refresh me. And then God sovereignly, supernaturally did something. And we've rebuilt the campus. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. And, and so the Lord has been gracious. But I want to show you what happens uh, or what can happen to you when you think things go wrong. There's resolution in the love of the Lamb. And this is the beauty of believing the gospel the gospel of the finished work of Jesus Christ. So go with me in your scripture. By the way, all of you watching online, welcome as well. Listen, the presence and power of the Lord is right where you're at, just like in this sanctuary. So just get ready to receive. Go with me, if you would, to Mark's gospel, chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 in verse 24. While you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Father, these are your beautiful people. Let their hearts find help and hope through the living word this day. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said... Amen. Jesus said in Mark 4, 24, he said unto them, take heed what you hear. Take heed what you hear. You know, we live in a world where everybody's got an opinion. Huh? And everybody's yakking and it's contentious, whether it's social media or anything. And sometimes I just like to find a quiet space and cut out all the nonsense and all the noise and all the contention whether it's political contention, whether it's health, COVID, uh, you know, conflicts, whatever, whatever the conflicts are, because this stuff can trouble you. And it can bring like little explosions and you think, why am I so agitated all the time? Why am I so grumpy? You know, why, why am I so, you know, and what I've had to do since I was with you is isolate myself from what I hear. Jesus said, take heed what? You hear the content, the content of what you hear, whether it's from the right, the left, the center, or whatever world it comes from. Take heed what you hear, because what you need to hear is something from the heart of the Father. That's the only stabilizer, the only consistency, the only truth that will allow you triumph when there's storms, when there's explosions, when there's chaos, when there's things none of us can explain. Take heed what you hear. Look at Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 8. He said, therefore, take heed how you hear, how you hear. So take heed what you hear, the content, take how you, your attitude. That's why, like even with certain family members of mine, there's certain conversations I can never have. I'm just not going there with anything. I'd rather say, hallelujah, you want a meal, wonderful, the time's up, you know what I mean? Because everything else is contentious. But take heed what you hear, the content. Take heed how you hear the attitude. It's the same with the gospel. you got to take heed what you hear because people can say everything in here is gospel. Well, it's got to be in, seen through the lens of Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to misunderstand really who you are and you're going to put all the pressure on you to be something that you never have to qualify for you've been pre-approved. There's a, there's a different way to look at the... Take heed what you hear, take heed how you hear. Come with a tenderness now, 
Why? Because explosions are blowing the daylights out of everything, and none of us know how to fix nothing. None of us do, whether it's my explosion in Lebanon or your chaos around here or in your family or in your world. Just like Heidi and I, you know, if we gave you testimonies of the chaos in our world, we wouldn't have time. We'd have to have an extended days of meetings, you know what I mean, just to <laughs> tell you our trouble. But this is the beauty of believing. Yeah. We're sealed in Christ yeah. with all the chaos, all the heartache, all the pain that any of us experience right now in these next few moments, you're going to receive something that's so going to wrap you up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to intoxicate you with a type of love that lifts you. Love always lifts. Love lifts me, huh? Like the old lyric of the old song. So let me show you what I mean. Go with me. I'm going to tell you a Bible story. Are you all glad you're here? Go with me to Acts chapter 20. And I'm going to go through these, uh, this little Bible story slowly and kind of chit-chat through it, okay? Just to give you some, uh, some ideas of what I'm trying to convey. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, here's what the Bible says. Now, on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, let's pause. They were coming together to break bread. What's that? Have a meal? Probably. But also have the communion meal. Breaking bread. In other words, in the book of Acts, when it's talking about breaking bread, it's, it's, the, it's the supper. It's, it's reminding themselves of the love of God in Christ who's reconciled us, so they partake of the bread in the cup. It's communion. So it says, on the first day they came together to break bread, Paul, let's pause again, who's Paul? Paul was a dude who used to be called Saul. Hmm? And the Bible records a lot about this brother's life. Saul, it says, uh, was really learned in, in, in uh, his understanding of Judaism. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said, of himself. He was very schooled. He was a scholar. He was brilliant, but he did not like those folk who were following this Jesus, the followers of the way. So the Bible says he was consenting to their death. He was bringing chaos and havoc and explosions in the lives of people, hauling them off to be, you know, really bound or in prison or whatever. And so this is the Saul who in Acts chapter 9 has a visitation from the one he's persecuting, Jesus. And it said there was, a, there was a, a bright light that was brighter than the noonday sun, and it knocked Saul to the ground. And then there was a voice, the Lamb of God, Jesus spoke, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Love gripped him in a way that blinded him to show him he wasn't seeing correctly. He wasn't hearing correctly. His heart wasn't tender enough to understand the truth. And so the Lord told him, he said, listen, I'm going to show you where to hang out and who you're going to hang out with. You need right friendships. You need right relationships who can teach you properly what to hear, how to hear, and how your life can work so it's not so chaotic. And so this guy named Ananias was his instructor. And later in Saul's life, who became Paul, he gave a testimony in Acts chapter 22 about what Ananias taught him. Five things. God has chosen you. You can know his will. You will see Jesus. You will hear his voice. You will be his witness. These were the principles of preservation. What revelation brought preservation so Saul could become Paul. So he became an angry, terror-filled, religious zealot who became Paul, the apostle of grace. Okay? And in Acts chapter 9, it says straightway he began to preach. Now, this is Years later, this is Acts 20, this is like 10, 12 years later, okay? So now he's, 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 it said they came together to have communion and to have a meal and to yak, to have some fellowship, right? Paul, the Apostle Paul, ready to depart the next day, he spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. Let's pause again. (laughs) The brother's long-winded, Hallelujah. I want you to know today, I'm not going to preach till midnight. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. In fact, I'm going to even encourage you more. I'm not even going to preach till high noon. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but he, this, this guy preached his message till midnight. What do you think Paul preached? Paul preached Paul's revelation. Pauline revelations. That's what theologians call it. 
Do you know your Bible? You have the Old Testament showing the old covenant that God gave the Jewish folk. And then Jesus' life in the Gospels in the New Testament. But the new covenant starts at the cross, at the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And now there's a new covenant. Now this guy, Paul, was preaching Paul's revelation or Pauline revelation. The Bible says that Paul, when he was converted, straightway preached Christ to people. It's, it's a salvation message. But then Paul says, he read, uh, writes about it in the book of Galatians, that God took him aside and he was unknown by face for over three years. He was in the desert. And in the desert, God, through Jesus, spoke with him. And he gave him the revelation of the new covenant. And then he comes back and he revealed to the, to the leadership of the church his revelation, and the church agreed with it, that the revelation now is not just Christ to you, it's Christ in you. Yeah. It's the mystery of Christ in you. This is the gospel. Yeah. And this is the beauty of believing. So then you have in your Bible, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written by different authors. You have the book of Acts, written by Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke. And then you have Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Titus, you know, 1 and 2 Timothy. All these books, Hebrews, written by Paul. And so people call this Pauline revelation because this is the words of Jesus to the church, not according to Jesus' natural life, but according to Jesus' redemptive life. And this is where you and I understand who we are. So Paul's preaching. Let's get back to our story. He's preaching Pauline revelation. It says, now on the first day of the week, they came together. He continued his message till midnight. Verse 8, it goes on to say, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Let's pause again. Anytime there's Pauline revelation, the light will come on. Anytime you have the message of the finished work of Jesus, you're going to have wisdom. Anytime the revelation of what God has done for you in Christ, you're going to have illumination. You're not going to live like you're in the dark. You're not going to live discouraged. You're not going to be overwhelmed. You have illumination. You have revelation. There's many lamps always present in the preaching of Paul's revelation. Now, if the light's not going on, maybe you're not listening to the right stuff. Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. Because every time the gospel of the Lamb of God, the finished work is proclaimed, there's illumination, there's revelation. The light comes on. Have you ever been somewhere talking with somebody and they're talking about Jesus or heard somebody preach and it's like, man, this is awesome. It's like I never heard this before, you know? This is what Paul's revelation will do for you. It will trigger you. It will give you some energy. It will motivate you. It will give you a whole new perspective of the chaos. I'm preaching good now. Look at this now. <laughs> go, go to verse 9 real quick. The next verse. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus. Let's pause. Eutychus, his name means good fortune or good favor. This is what every human heart craves. Every human heart craves fortune. Every human heart craves favor. This can be your greatest asset in life, the favor of the Father, a.k.a. the grace of God. The grace of God. So Eutychus, favor, good fortune, sitting in a window, but he was sinking into a deep sleep. The greatest challenge in the church today is that the church falls asleep to Paul's revelation. They're not hearing right. They're not thinking right. They don't have the revelation of the Lamb in its full intent and context and strength and power. So he was sleeping to Paul's preaching, Paul in Revelation. He was overcome by sleep, and Paul continued preaching. He fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. This is a meeting that went wrong. <laughs> Now, somebody, we were talking before the service, Heidi and I, about different things over this. Over, I could tell you some mission stories through the last almost 40 years of doing, oh, man, meet, meetings that go wrong. But listen, this is, this is a bad meeting. When, when one of the guys falls 
from the third story. That's like 30 feet. Boom. The dude's dead. They're not guessing that he's dead. The dude's dead. You, you know what? My first thought is, I'll show you how carnal I am as a preacher. My, my first thought is, oh, no, what liability do I have? You know? <laughs> who's going to sue me? Because we live in a culture, people sue you for nothing, you know? And, and so I'm thinking, oh, no, who's going to sue me? What do, do, do I have whatever? Protect, you know? But that wasn't Paul's thought. No, look at this. But Paul went down. Paul went down. This is a picture of a person who's, who's completely loved. You're not afraid to go down. This is a picture of Jesus. Jesus came down. Those of us who are hearing right, those of us who are understanding the context of the gospel, we're not afraid to go into the mess of somebody else's life, especially those who are spiritually dead or living like they're dead. There's a lot of Christian people who put their faith in Christ, but they've fallen asleep to Paul's revelation, and they're living like they're dead men. They're living carnal Christian lives. Oh, yeah. And they try to justify it. So all you can do is, you know, listen to their frustration, trying to justify their whatever. But, but Paul, he went down, and he fell on him, and he embraced him. And then he said something. He said, do not trouble yourselves. His life is in him. Now think with me. Think with me. Just use your imagination. Let's, let's pretend I'm Paul. I'm preaching. Paul's revelation, the finished work of Jesus, the dude drops. Zzz, boom. The dude's dead. I'm the preacher. I go down, and I don't say, uh, call 911. I don't say, oh, no, call my lawyer. No. I fall on him. That's what the Bible says. I fall on him, and I embrace him. He's dead. I fall on him, and I embrace him. I call it the embrace of grace. It's the embrace of the revelation of Paul, Paul in Revelation. This is the only way a human heart can be lifted. It takes Pauline revelation to give people new life. It takes the revelation of the cross, which Paul preached exclusively. He said, I know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he would say things like, and you have been crucified with him. What? You died with him. What? You were buried with him. You were raised with him. You ascended with him. You're seated with him. That's Pauline revelation. Say, Keith, explain it to me. I can't. It's a mystery you take by faith. I'm leaving town soon. Your pastor can explain it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh huh? But you know what? I'll preach the love of God in Christ and just wrap people up with the revelation of the reconciled innocence. They don't know they possess it yet because they haven't had faith to receive it yet. But I'll tell them the truth from God's point of view. God sees you in Christ. This is why we invade the explosions of people. You do it by faith. And the only news you have to announce is news that turns the light on. It's the love of God that's forgiven you once and for all for all time. I was preaching good and now I'm crying good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Paul went down, fell on him, said don't trouble yourselves. Let's go back to that previous verse if we can real quick. Do not trouble yourselves. Notice if you have Paul's revelation and you believe it, you say something. Yes. This is where faith triggers you to say something that makes no sense. It makes, look what he said. He said, don't trouble, what do you mean don't trouble myself? The dude's dead. He's my son. <laughs> don't trouble yourself, mama. Don't trouble yourself, daddy, about nothing. Your kids, your grandkids, your world. Life is in him.
Can you say something? Don't be afraid. Just speak the word. His life is in him. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 11. It says, now when they had come up, how they returned. When they had come and had broken bread, communion, and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak. This happened at midnight, and now it's daybreak. Then Paul departed. Think about this with me. When Paul raised the dead, they didn't say, yay, Paul, what a great man of God. They didn't go back up and have more meetings. Oh, let's have more preaching and more seminars. Nope. They celebrated by taking up communion because all praise goes to Jesus. It's the revelation of the finished work. It's all about the Lamb. All praise goes to Jesus. So what you do is you take the bread and you eat. You have the cup of blessing and you drink. You eat, drink, and you're merry. And you know, you know what you do? You yak. I'm from the Midwest. I'm a little country boy. We use the term yak. You know what yak is? That means you just yak. <laughs> you yak at yak. You talk. You sit around the table and you laugh and you talk and you say, Jesus is our victory. Jesus is our solution in the explosions of life. Jesus is our solution in the fires of life. Jesus is our solution in our depression and fears. Christ is our life. And they yacked until morning. Then Paul said, adios. I'm out of here. Hmm? The embrace of grace, it's your way into good fortune. Eutychus, good fortune, stop listening to the gospel of grace. And when you stop listening to the gospel of grace, you'll fall from grace. Fall from grace doesn't mean you sin. Fall from grace has to do with what you hear. And you go to a mindset of thinking your righteousness is based on your works or efforts to the law. That's what Paul said, read it in the book of Galatians. He said, you fall from grace based on what you're hearing and how you're hearing. The only way you're restored is to have an embrace of grace. You have to embrace people in their deep brokenness. You have to embrace people in their deepest sin. Do you notice when they took the brother back up, Paul never corrected him and rebuked him for what he did wrong? People say, well, Keith, don't you think he should have been, you know, rebuked and chastised? Doesn't the word say, you know, it brings correction and instruction? Yes, it does. And maybe he should have, but not at that time. There's times where people can't digest how to live yet. They need to digest just the love of God. They need to be lifted. They need to be reconciled to the God. And then with time, the word will correct people and help people and bring them into the place where they can understand that what they're doing is carnal or fleshly or sinful or whatever. It's very, very important that we just understand that God wants to lift us up and restore perfect favor to every part of our lives. Look at it, it says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. This is what Paul said. To reveal his son in me. This is what, what God gave him when he was in the desert. It's now Christ in you that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And that also that the gospel is inclusive for everyone everywhere. It's not just for the Jewish folk. It's for the human folk. It's, it's for everyone everywhere. Christ in you. It's a beautiful thing and so very powerful. Go with me to real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Are you all so glad you're here? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Therefore, Paul said, now this is Pauline revelation now. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one or know no one according to the flesh. Now, see, this is hard to live, but this is Paul's revelation. Most of us get disappointed in people because we know people according to the flesh. That's why your spouse gets on your nerves. Just look straight ahead now. Hallelujah. This, 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 is, why, this is why your kids bug you. 
Your grandkids bug you. Because you know people going to the flesh. This is why the visiting preacher now bugs you. This, Paul said, you know no one now according to the flesh. Now we know everybody according to the cross. Look at this now. Even though we have known Jesus Christ according to the flesh. The book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Yet from now on, we know him thus no longer. In Pauline Revelation, there's no story about Jesus in a physical sense. It's his redemptive work. And it's his redemptive work is what redeems you. The next verse says in verse 17, therefore, it's the verse you know by heart, therefore, because of this verse, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, now all things are made new. So the gospel shows us the life of Jesus according to the flesh, but the epistles, or Paul's revelation, show us the life of Jesus according to his redemptive work or his redemptive life. And this is what turns the light on for you. This is where religion never becomes a work. You just realize it's been a work in you. And now through yielding, through your love and worship, he lives his life through you. There's a manifestation of his goodness and grace. Let me show you one other verse, then I think I'm going to have to finish. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. This is the Apostle Peter. Now, look what he says about Paul's teaching. As also in all his epistles, speaking of the Apostle Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Some things are hard to understand. Some things are hard to understand. You know why people fall asleep to Paul's revelation? Because they're trying to get it with natural head knowledge. It's spiritual truth. And that's why sometimes when you come to church, especially with beautiful, deep, rich Bible te- My son is, a, is one of these kind of line-upon-line Bible teacher guys. Beautiful, brilliant, all wrapped in the finished work of Jesus. And I love but, to listen to him, but it's loaded. You got you to really be ready for it. And after I go to his uh, services, I was there last Sunday, and I leave, and I'm a preacher. And I leave, and I tell Heidi going home, I said, I couldn't preach that if I lived a 1,000 years. It's so deep. He has, he has such, it's beautiful. It's astonishing. But it's what I need. I need to enlarge and extend. And that's why sitting in church sometimes, you may be tempted, ah, I don't need it. Ah, it's easy now not to need it, Right? You got excuses, rules, COVID, this, government, blah, blah. You can, you can make up a rule that everybody has to applaud you, but you've got to decide how much light you want and if you want the light on. And the things that are hard to understand, just sit still. Just let the gospel be spoken over you. Let the revelation of Jesus, even if you say, I don't know, man, this can it be. Sit still. God will give you faith to swallow it. And when you swallow it, it will lift you because it's an embrace of grace. The way you receive an embrace of grace is not necessarily through a human being. The embrace of grace is the revelation of Paul. You can hug yourself anytime you want. You know what I do uh, when I'm traveling? And I'm traveling again now, thank God, preaching. But so, so, for example, on a recent trip, I was just uh, listening to Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 on my, on my, my Bible on my phone. Listening, listening, listening. listening. Why? You say, why? Well, it's the revelation of the finished work of Jesus. I was getting hugged on the whole journey. See, in Paul's writings, in Pauline Revelation, the first part of his chapters, like in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, is about the work of the one. But then 4, 5, and 6 is how that is live through you. And it, it turns a light on for you on how to even be a good husband. How to, how to work for your employer. How to be angry and not sin. How to, how to put on the new man, not live with the old life. It shows you how to live out, but you can only live it out if you're equipped in the revelation of it. So you have to have the revelation of Paul. This is where you understand the truth of Jesus. But it's hard to understand. According to Peter... And then he says, people twist it. Untaught folk, people don't listen to it constantly and correctly, and unstable folk, they'll twist all this stuff for destructive purposes, as they do the rest of the scriptures. 
And so you got to decide in life, do you want good fortune? Do you want good favor? It's all found in the Lamb of God. God loves you completely, whether you, whether you like it or not. But you can position yourself for an embrace of grace, the full favor of the Father in Christ Jesus. Did you all enjoy the word today? Yeah. Give the Lord a shout. Hallelujah. <laughs> no one ever cares for you like Jesus, just like the verse your pastor read. Cast all your care. He cares for you. And you know what? Jesus wants to just give you an embrace where the light comes on, where there's no more uh, haziness, no more smog, no more smoke, no more chaos, no more explosions. Cut out the nonsense. I don't care what worldview it's from. If it's not from Paul's revelation, it will trouble you. Live in the reality of the kingdom of God's dear son. Father, these are your precious people. I bless them now. I pray for them. I speak over their lives. Let their hearts find help and hope. I speak healing. I speak resurrection life over brokenness, over pain, over suffering, over fear over anything dead in their life. Spiritual darkness, deception. I speak the favor of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus. Let they experience good fortune and may they take their place seated in heavenly places with Christ. We give you praise, Father, for the living word. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Did you enjoy it? Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you so much, Keith. I tell you, that was so empowering and so encouraging, and I trust you all received that uh, this morning. And Father, we thank you for that precious word that has gone out today, and may it go deep into the hearts of your people today to live in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fullness of the finished work by which we become lights and testimonies in this world. We're so thankful for it. Those of you watching today, face, Facebook or YouTube, we, we pray God's going to minister to your heart as well. Can we take a moment to bow our heads and close our eyes? Because I don't want to close out the service today. I want to do several things before we close. And the first one is, if you never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, those of you watching today as well, to receive the embrace of his grace that Keith talked about, you must acknowledge him. You must receive him. The Bible says, to as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. You must call upon him and say, Jesus, I receive you. I make you the Lord of my life. I believe that God raised you from the dead. And the Bible says, when you pray that prayer, new life comes inside of you. Maybe you're here today and you've just gone cold towards God and you just need a rededication, a re-consecration of your life to hear properly and to refresh your life and say, Lord, I've been doing my own thing. I'm done with that. But I want to concentrate, recommit my life to the Lord and to his word. So if that's you today, you need Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or you need a new start, a fresh beginning, and you want to rededicate, reconcentrate your life to the Lord. On those two invitations, please lift your hands. Pastor Fred, I need Jesus, or I need a new start, a fresh revelation. Anybody with an uplifted hand today, pray for me. I need Jesus or I need a new commitment, a fresh commitment to the Lord today. Those of you watching, you might have that in your heart as well to call upon him. Let's say this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. I make Jesus Christ both Lord and Savior of my life. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I trust my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Those of you who prayed that prayer, we rejoice with you. And we encourage you to continue to come and learn and grow in your faith and in your walk with God today. Hey, listen, let me remind you before we're dismissed, don't forget, every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we have prayer here in the sanctuary and, and a prayer for uh, those that need to be healed, those that want hands laid upon them. We also have the communion table over here, prayer clause, those that can come at 10 o'clock, and we just have a few minutes, about 10 or 15 minutes or so, that we pray and pray for people. So if you need 
prayer or you know someone who needs prayer, they need healing, they need miracles, that's the time to come. 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, just before church starts, and we pray for folks and we receive communion, those that would like that. So just, again, make you aware that that is happening at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. You're welcome to come for that if you like. Amen. Now, to receive our tithes and offerings today, um, there's a couple ways you can give. Uh, as you know, each and every week, we encourage you to take advantage of that. Thank you for honoring God with your tithes and offerings. And because of your giving, the church continues. Ministries like Keith and Heidi, we can continue to support. So we're so thankful for that. And if you want to know more about Keith and Heidi's ministry, you can go to mutualfaith.org. Mutualfaith.org. And you can learn about them. If you want to give to them personally, if you want to even support their ministry on a monthly basis, you can ask them about it or go to their website and, and you can get connected to them. Give Keith and Heidi another round of applause. Let them know we love you guys. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing the gospel of grace around the world, how the world desperately needs it. And so we thank you for having that in your hearts and, and declaring Jesus. Are you ready for the blessing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak this blessing over everyone. If you'd like, you can lift your hands here in the house. Those of you watching as your pastor, I declare, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord protect and prosper your way, you and your loved ones throughout this week, according to Psalm 91, that you dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. I declare that God gives his angels charge concerning you to keep you in your ways, that no evil, plague, disaster, or calamity comes near your dwelling. May his grace and peace abound to you in Jesus' name. And may God place you at the right place at the right time with the right people. And finally, may his shalom, peace, and rest be your constant companion throughout this week. In Jesus' name, say amen if you receive that. God bless you all. We love you. You are dismissed.